Good morning. This is Tracy Hales Vast with Right on Four Corners on KSJE 90.9 FM. Today, it's my pleasure to interview Stu Mossberg, author of In the Shadows of Canyon Road and Good Days, Bad Days. Good morning, Stu. Good morning, Tracy. How is the weather up there in Bayfield? Rainy. Oh, I like rain. Yeah, we love it. You bet. Always use <laughs> we can that. use the water for sure. Absolutely. Well, I um, thoroughly enjoyed In the Shadows of Canyon Road and the short stories. Thank you. Uh, good days, bad days. But they are very different books. Quite. Yes. So tell me about, well, first of all, why don't you tell our readers a little summation of In the Shadows of Canyon Road? You know, it's interesting. I can give you some background on how I came to it. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I love Canyon Road. Me and too. It's one of my favorite streets in, in the world, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I first visited it about 25 years ago, and uh, I was just on holiday, a brief holiday from New York where I lived, and uh, thought it was just phenomenal. And my background is art and, uh, and design. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I also have some background in uh, Mexico and Spain. And so it was particularly fascinating to me because it combined all my loves. Oh, yeah. And um, I went back several times over the years. And um, when I moved to Colorado, hello, it's about almost 18 years ago now, mm-hmm. 17 years ago, uh, it was to write full time. And um, it almost seemed natural for me to write a story about Canyon Road. Um, and that's really kind of how it developed. Oh. Uh, instead of a passion and a love for the arts and a love for Canyon Road and what part of Canyon Road uh, most people don't see. Right. Uh, unless, of course, you live there. Right. Um, and, and that's really where the story came about. I really tried to find a way to explain to lay people who are not in the arts, per se, or particularly familiar with the gallery world and whatnot, what goes on behind closed doors. Yes. And, uh, and that, in fact, is the, uh, the, the prologue to the story uh, addresses that issue. So mm-hmm. The story itself is it's not a historical novel. It's all fiction. Uh, the characters are fiction, although probably based on some people I've met and Mm -hmm. come across. I I know a lot of gallery owners, a lot of artists, you know, so I'm sure I picked something up along the way with that. But uh, the the story itself is is about intertwined characters and the relationships they have from one to another, sometimes unknown to themselves, but also the relationships they each have to Canyon Road. Right. So fundamentally, it's, it's, you know, it's storytelling. Uh, through narrative and, and, and dialogue. And when I describe things, I try to be as authentic as possible. Your descriptions Which, are amazing, especially of the you. clothing. Yeah, thank you. I was really impressed. I could see those characters. Well, that's, that's what I hope to do with it. I, you know, lots of times when I write, I write with the idea of it being a, a film. Uh-huh. So I visualize a lot of the, the, you know, the settings and the characters and so forth. Right. Um, so it's very descriptive in that regard. I, th- I would say that the, the main character in the story is Martin Gomez mm-hmm. um, and his connection to almost everybody in the story, except he doesn't know it. Right. You know, so that's it, true. He, he's a young painter, um, an unknown painter, and, and that's kind of what the story keeps coming back to. You know, he's a character that I love very, very much. He's a very sympathetic character, I think. I do, too. I really liked him. But you have so many other stories within there, like a love story. Um, Well, we do. I talk about artists and mm -hmm. the relationship to galleries and and some of the underhanded business that goes on. I know gallery owners listening aren't going to be pleased with that, but there is a certain amount of uh, competitiveness, in particular on Canyon Road, which has so many galleries. Right. You know, uh, there has to be some competition involved. Mm -hmm. And I try to get into that uh, behind the scenes uh, of what it's like, what a gallery does, uh, how they find their artists, how they price their work, you know, right. how they deal with their customers and clients, and, and do it in an interesting way, not a didactic way. You know. Mm-hmm. And there are 
um, nice gallery owners, and there are not so nice gallery owners in this book. Very true. Mm -hmm. It's the world, it's a microcosm. Exactly. It was. It was like its own little world there. Well, it is, too. I think that is the case with Canyon Road. It is so, you know, it's not insulated necessarily, but it is so, you know, it's so concise. Yes. And there's an intensity to it. You can spend literally weeks going from one gallery right. to another, in a, which I love about it. And um, tell us a little bit about your book of short stories also. Mm. Yeah, um, that's called Good Days, Bad Days. Right. And uh, basically that's what it is. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's ordinary people in, in extraordinary circumstances. And um, there are 31 short stories. And it's a collection that I put together over a long period of time. Um, my inspiration for it is purely out of curiosity and, and uh, looking into things and then wondering what if. You know, so it's, there's something for everybody in there. There are a wide yeah. variety of stories, <laughs> for sure. Yep. I have, there's human interest, there's mm -hmm. uh, murder mysteries, yes. science fiction and fantasy, uh, unconventional romance. Right. Um, you know, there's even some historical information right. uh, stories in there. So some family there's drama. That interests me. I'm sorry? Family drama. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Douglas and Louise. That's in right. Particular. right. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, some of, there's so many stories in there. There's only one story in there that had been previously published. And that is the one called White Ghost, mm. which is a story of a man and his dog, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of Jack Londonist, right? Uh, you know, lost in the in the tundra and and uh, up in Alaska, and uh, the story between them and finding some mysterious creature out in the tundra, right. uh, and one leaving the reader to wonder whether it's real or it isn't. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the other stories were all, that's the first time they've been published. Uh, well, they're very tight and very, and they move really quickly, but yet tell full stories. There's such a different art to sh the short story. Mm -hmm. And you've done really well with that. And the Thank endings, um, bam. Well, they're really. all supposed to be surprise endings. And they least. are, yes. <laughs> you want to sort of like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Exactly. You know, that was, that's my hope with that. And to your point, I think short stories, it's such a different genre for a writer. Um, mm -hmm. You have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, you have to resolve it in a very short period. Right. Rather than having four or 500 pages to deal with it. Yes. Um, and that's a challenge, um, which, you know, excites me. Which do you prefer writing? I think the... Um, well, the short story is because of the expediency, but you know right. what? It takes just as long to write it. It does. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, but I do. I enjoy that because I can get to resolve it. When I write, I, I'm. I don't. A lot of writers um, that I know uh, outline things in advance. They work out the whole plot and subplots, the characters and all, right. uh, in advance. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like the excitement and. The mystery itself. I don't. I don't know from the beginning where it's going. Uh, um, I may have an idea. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, lots of times I'll have dialogue uh, in my head. Yes. Between the two characters or three characters, whatever, mm -hmm. who's involved, uh, not knowing where it's going, play it out. You know, how's this sound? What does what does that do? Um, so that when I sit down to work and to write, I have a general idea. But let it take it there by itself. You know, that's let the fun. story unravel on its own. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have all kinds of adventures behind you. Were you writing? I mean, in here in your book flap, it says you've, you've bull ring in Mexico, <laughs> Formula 2 race cars, yes. skiing, scuba diving, etc., yeah. hiking. In all this, and a with your, interest, a, right? yes. <laughs> so, in all your activities, have you been writing the whole time? I started writing as a teenager. Ah, um, terrible stuff, I might add. But uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it, it it was interesting that I had the wherewithal to do that. Yes, and, uh, but I didn't write anything professionally until my, uh, my adulthood, and my first two books were nonfiction books. Uh huh. Um, 
they were about design, one kind or another, okay. uh, which was my profession, I was mm-hmm. in the design business. Uh, but I loved the process. Having had some modicum of success with those two books, I thought, you know, I would really like to do, I'd like to tell stories of some kind or other. But I had a full-time job, and, you know, writing fiction would take forever. Yes. And uh, I reached a point where I just said, this is really what I want to do from now on. Oh, good. <laughs> good to and you. so I gave it up. I, I moved out to Colorado and just started writing from experience, uh, from my own personal experience and stories. And, um, and, that's, and that's going back to what I said earlier about visiting Canyon Road. It stayed with me all those years. Right. And became the, you know, the story. Did you, in fact, make trips back to Canyon Road while yeah. you were writing? Yeah, absolutely did that. I mean, there was, uh, not only for the emotional sense, mm-hmm. you know, to, to capture the core and the essence of the street, but to to take footsteps in, this, in the character, take the character's footsteps. Right. You know, to walk through the Canyon Road like Martin might do, mm-hmm. or like uh, Keith Wheeler might do, or Charles. Right. Um, to become more familiar with, with some of the locations um, outside of Canyon Road where some of the characters live. And then, of course, to do a photo expo there. I, I just, I took so many photographs. Oh, I bet you um, did. You know, and the cover photograph is one that I took as well, which oh, that's I very selected nice. from, from, I don't know, maybe 100. <laughs> wow, I can see that, yeah. It's a gorgeous, yeah. typical Thank you. Santa Fe adobe house yes so yeah, that turned out to be perfect for that that's perfect first i wanted to talk about the artist paulo paulo rinaldi paulo yes he yeah. uh <laughs> an interesting artist i wonder how many artists are like that yeah that's he he was one of the characters reminded me more of a romance character I, yes yes I <laughs> you know i saw him parading bare chested right uh, being very arrogant, and yes, something like that, um, and he's the antithesis of Martin. Exactly what I was going to say, right? Yeah, <laughs> just like and Keith is the antithesis of Charles. Yep. Yep. Exactly, and that that was a natural progression. Uh huh. You know how that happened to show both sides of it, as you had mentioned earlier. Right. The gallery world. There are good and there are bad. And not no no reflection on my next book, but um, right. That that was really that's really truly the case. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. As is uh, Barbara Dearborn, right. uh, Hollingsworth, uh, to stepdaughter Vanessa or Moira, or Moira. Restaurant owner. Yes, um, they were very opposite. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I liked Moira very much. Lovely lady, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. One of my favorite characters there is Marta yes. Rodriguez y Encantada. Right. The, the doyen of of the art world. That's right. Yeah, she is a character that, mm-hmm. uh, again, a probably an amalgam of people that I know. She, she made a lot of decisions for. She made things happen, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In a quiet, quiet way. Right. Yeah. And sincere. Elegant lady. Mm-hmm. I liked her. <laughs> Do you want to read something for our sure. audience? I'd be happy to. Yeah. The um, prologue. Yes, the, that's beautiful. The description, I think. Uh, okay. For those. Listening, I think the uh, Canyon Road locale is, is something that does stay with you as it did with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me let me read that. Okay. The shadows creeping across Canyon Road bisect its buildings into chiaroscuro works of art, creating blocks of contrasting light and dark that inspired so many artists to move to Santa Fe almost a hundred years ago. No matter how cold or hot it may be, the clay-colored adobe walls with their aqua and turquoise-trimmed windows and doors always offer a warm, inviting welcome, like low, sultry flames dancing in a fireplace. Their rounded corners beg to be touched and offer the promise of comfort, as if they are old friends. It is beyond the shadows, behind the walls of the houses and art galleries, where the real stories exist. Maybe we can pick up with uh, a little bit of Martin Gomez. Oh, good, good. Martin Gomez woke to the calling of a raven, rose quietly from the sofa, knocked on the bedroom door to wake his sisters, 
and called to his brother to get up. Hey, R- R- Russ, you better get into the bathroom b- 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 before the girls do. Aunt Teha, a salt and pepper hair tied loosely at the back of her neck, scuffed about in the kitchen brewing coffee and fixing breakfast for the family. The whole house smelled of fried bread and bacon fat. Kissing her on the top of her head, Martin whispered, Buenos dia. She smiled without looking up. Take her race to catch the two buses that would get her to the Wheeler house to start her work day. Martin walked across the dusty yard to his studio. The tiny workspace was as cold as the early morning air outside, and he blew into his hands and rubbed them together before switching on the small heater. The pain on his palate had frozen during the night. His breath hung in the air for a second and then vanished. Martin squatted in front of the easel and stared at the canvas, deciding what to do next. Monday were his favorite day. No distractions, only his art, his passion, and precious daylight. He crouched for a long time, studying the colors that he had laid down the night before. Satisfied, he set about chipping the hardened paint from the palette. After futile attempts with the scraper, he resorted to a chisel to pry it loose. When the palette was clean, he squirted new paint onto the board in a clockwise sequence, creating a spectrum of color around the perimeter. He began slowly, stepping back from time to time to observe his progress, making tiny grunting noises as he painted, his round face turning this way and that, looking up and down making sure it all fit the image he held in his mind's eye. That's Martin. That's Martin. (laughs) Was it difficult to write about art and describe the paintings? You know, I'm glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. I I think that ultimately that was one of my key goals, Mm -hmm. um, to write this from an artist's perspective, but in a way that people who don't paint who may wonder about it. What does an artist really do? You know, right. all I see is the end result. Mm-hmm. How do they work? And of course, I do get into their mind more, you know, pa- Paolo being the other painter. Right. Um, you know, how do they think? How do you see things? You know, as artists, you look at, really do see things differently. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, different details stand out. How do you decide, well, what goes where? You know, building a, building a composition. And so I wanted to get into that in a way that people would uh, feel it yes. if they were the artists themselves. That was, that was the hope. I actually learned a lot. Mm. So that's, that's, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be pedantic about it. You know, mm-hmm. writing in a way that, it, I don't, I'm not even sure the word pontificating, if you will. Right, right. You know, using big words just to be impressive. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I do try to explain, if I use an odd word or a peculiar word, mm-hmm. what, what the meaning of it is. Uh, well, it's definitely uh, an intelligent book, but definitely approachable and readable. Thank you. As are the stories. As are the short stories you have here. Yeah. Um, which is your favorite short story? In- oh, <laughs> not fair. <laughs> I, I knew you'd love that question. <laughs> <laughs> that is a real tough one to do. I, I, You know, I think... Oddly enough, the plan may be the one with Harlan. Oh yeah, um, it's just you know hapless Harlan. It's and yeah. known people like that. Yes, like me too. Um, yeah, you know, and it's just you know, it's like, oh my God, get get real, will you please? Yes. You, you know, get a life, get a, get yourself together. Right. You know? um, <laughs> so there is it's it's a moral tale in a way, but um, he, yeah, I, I would have to say from that. Today, ask me tomorrow, I might give you a different answer. I understand that, yes, completely. <laughs> um, Hidden, which is the story about the witness protection program. Right. The, um, the murder mystery. Um, that, that actually started as a novel years ago. I was wondering if it um, could have turned into a novel yeah. at some point, because it's a police procedural. Yes, it is. And, and I, we, interestingly enough, I started that so many years ago, before actually I'd even been to Canyon Road. So we're going back 30 years, maybe. Mm-hmm. And I started that uh, writing longhand. Oh, wow. And uh, the manuscript that I was writing, pages of legal paper, pages, I managed to leave in the seat pocket of an airplane. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> and this was before, you know, I really worked on the computer and didn't, didn't have word. Oh, no, back up of it. <laughs> and oh. I just lost. I couldn't go back and do it again. I just was like so devastated. Oh, you know? I can't even uh, imagine. But it stayed, the story stayed with me. Right. And, and I went, oh, okay, now I'm writing this. Why not put that in the short story? Work yeah. it out. Uh, do that. So it is it, that, along with White Ghost, are the two longest, mm-hmm. physically longest stories. Right. Uh, but still, they tell a lot in a short amount of space. Mm-hmm. That one, the police procedural, reminded me of a really good murder mystery. Mm-hmm. Very visual yeah. also. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it very, very much. Yeah, so... One thing, like we talked about, that struck me is the difference in these books. I mean, Mm -hmm. stories. Each one of the stories is so different from the other ones. Yeah. So your mind must be um, going in all kinds of ways. Working all the time. Evidently. You know, I I, I read, I don't read a lot of books, oddly enough. Sorry Mm -hmm. to say for my my author friends, but... um, (laughs) I read a lot of periodicals, journals, magazines, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Um, again, and, which are almost short stories in a way. They are. They're That's well true. Done. And I will come across something that really interests me enough to pursue it further. And then it's that what-if moment. Right. Hey, gee, I wonder, what if that? And, right. then, and I run with it from there. Uh, great. Um, transparent, for example. I had read a story in Smithsonian Magazine about some, the uncovering of some Egyptian tomb that they had been exploring using you know, robotic uh, cameras. And I just took that further. You did. Went, <laughs> went from there. Uh, resurrection, you know, the study, the, the yes. cloning DNA and, and things like that, again, are subjects that just, they're fascinating. They are fascinating. And you took that to the nth degree on that one. One of my favorite stories in there is Mr. Abaddon. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, yeah. And the story of, you know, greed. just how far will you go right. to right. do something or to win something or to earn something? Be you careful know, oh, when oh, you oh. say, I do anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Really? Oh. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> That's Mr. Abaddon. That's and right. Erickson. Yeah. What are you working on now? Um, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm taking a hiatus at the moment. Okay. You're you know, occasionally, to. I'll write a short story and and tuck it away in a file, mm-hmm. uh, in case I want to develop that. A lot of people have asked for a sequel to Sh- the Canyon Road. I can see that. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I've thought about it. I'm not sure. I've, well, I've been there, done that. Do I really want to do it again? Right. You know, I'm not one of these serial novelists who mm-hmm. keeps writing in the same same characters and stuff like that. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that. Right. They're very successful with it. But it's just I like the idea of keep experimenting and exploring that. So. And, and meeting new characters. Yes. I always like that part of it. Yes. Um, do you want to read something else from Good Days, Bad Days? Uh, sure. Let's see. We've been talking about Mr. Abaddon mm. and Transparent mm-hmm. and Hidden. Um, let me take something from Mr. Abaddon. Okay. Get through that quickly. Just for our listeners, uh, give a little bit of background. Ross... Ross Erickson is the key character, along with Mr. Abaddon, in this short story. And it's a fairly short story. Mm-hmm. I think the opening paragraphs tell the, tell the situation to set it up. It does. If you will. Okay. Um, Ross Erickson was teetering on the cusp of fame. He had been toiling for several years as a C-list actor. And according to his two former wives, would always be a nobody. But that was about to change, or so he prayed. He had recently received high praise for a small yet key role in a much-touted indie film. There was even Oscar buzz suggesting he was a front-runner. Soon after the nominations were announced, Ross began losing sleep, fantasizing at night about his acceptance speech, thumbing his nose at ex-wives and do-nothing agents. The night before his inaugural walk on the red carpet, He lay awake practicing aloud, all the while believing he would not, could not win. The air in his tiny apartment above the dry cleaner was stuffy. A helicopter chattered overhead, and car alarms punctuated the darkness. Around two in the morning, he finally fell into a deep, 
almost comatose state. The voice began low and raspy, otherworldly, and it addressed him by name. Ross, Ross, it's me, Abaddon. Wake up! Who, who are you, he groaned as he came awake. What, what do you want? A cloaked figure suddenly emerged from a thick, acrid cloud and came so close to Ross's face that the actor recoiled in terror. Whoa! Don't be alarmed, whispered the creature. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to help. Help me? The figure curled into itself like water disappearing down a drain. Ross bolted out of bed to search for the specter under, behind the window curtain, in the closet, but found no trace. He slumped on the bed and squeezed his eyes shut, trying to conjure the image of what he thought was more than a dream. That's... That's... The opener. And that really catches the interest of the reader. <laughs> Who um, is this? We, do you have time for one more? I can do... Uh, sure. Trans- yeah, I can read something from Transparent. Okay. Um, Transparent, as I said, is uh, based on um, discoveries, mm-hmm. and they're continually discovering the ancient tombs here and there. Um, the key character is Chester Swain, who is an Egyptologist who specializes in uh, ancient Egyptian medical practices. Right. And uh, there's a tomb discovered um, by some of his colleagues that goes back 4,000 years ago that's believed to be the tomb of a pharaoh's physician. Mm -hmm. So naturally, he, being an expert in the field, is called upon to come to see and witness the opening of the chamber. Restless from anticipation rather than fear, Chester barely slept and was dressed at sunup, downing a cup of pungent Turkish tea and borek filled with cheese and minced meat. He woke the loudly snoring El Sayed and nodded at Garib, who was sitting on the camel saddle in the sand. The team was assembled. Logistics for the entry were reviewed. Roles and positions defined for each of the participants. And most importantly, contingency plans discussed should any extreme measures be required. Within an hour, carrying halogen lanterns, they were inching their way along a labyrinth of tunnels toward the burial chamber, accompanied by two assistants, one bearing tools for opening the crypt, the other video equipment to record the event. Standing outside the sealed entry wall, which they all thought must be where the tomb lay, Garib gave the signal to make an opening through the partition. Wait, cried Chester. Let me do it. If there is, if there is something, let me be the one. I don't believe in spells or curses. In a more serious vein, he added, but just in case. The assistant handed him a large canvas bag containing excavating tools and then stepped away. Garib and Amon shook Chester's hand, joined the assistants, and moved a few meters down the tunnel. Garib waved and said, Allah marech. Thank you, called Chester. I may need it. His first thrust elicited a hollow thud, suggesting there was open space behind the wall. The second and third created a small opening the size of an orange through which seeped a miasmic blue-green vapor that engulfed him. He dropped the tool and swiped at the gas, trying to avoid inhaling any, but it was too late. He coughed and spit, but nothing discharged. Chet, are you all right? called Garib. Before Chester could reply, the wall in front of him collapsed and he was enveloped in this gaseous substance. Waving his arms to ward it off, he stumbled backward and fell to the floor. In the short time it took for the team to reach him, the mysterious fog had vanished. Mr. Swain, Al-Sayed cried out, are you all right? What happened? What was that? Oh, yes. And you know the answer. <laughs> mm-hmm. but I'm not going to tell. <laughs> very good. Well, that very, was fun. It was very fun. <laughs> Thank you.
Listeners can find your books where? The, the websites like Amazon and Barnes & Noble have them Great. Uh, available. You know, here in Durango, uh, Bayfield, the local bookstores have them because they count local artists. Yeah, that's, that's probably the fastest way to do it is online. Well, I have really enjoy talking with you and reading Crazy your likewise. books. And that was Stu Mossberg talking about his books, In the Shadows of Canyon Road and Good Days, Bad Days. This is Tracy Hales Vass, right on Four Corners, KSJE 90.9 FM in Farmington, New Mexico.